All right, so the second panel is how do health and health care costs affect people and programs? And the first paper is um, going to be presented by Melissa McInerney, and it's how much does out-of-pocket pocket Medicaid spending, medical spending, eat away at Social Security benefits? And her discussion is going to be Tricia Newman. So, Melissa. So I am thrilled to be here and gratefully acknowledge support from the Social Security Administration. This work is joint with Matt Rutledge and Sarah King from the Center for Retirement Research. And the overarching question that's guiding the research I present today is, are Social Security benefits adequate? Um, when answering this question, many consider the total retirement income provided, but what's really relevant to retirees is their purchasing power. So that is their income less non-discretionary spending. And retirees face several types of non-discretionary spending, out-of-pocket medical costs, which is the focus of the talk I'm giving today, but also housing costs, taxes, and other debts. And so this project examines Social Security income net of out-of-pocket medical costs from 2002 to 2014 14 using the health and retirement study. So why do we focus on out-of-pocket medical costs? Well, they can be substantial for retirees on Medicare, and I've listed many of them here. I won't go into details on most of them, but enrollees pay premiums for various parts of Medicare that they have. They face premiums for Part B, which covers their physician and outpatient care. They face premiums if they enroll in Medicare Part C in some cases, which is the Medicare Advantage plan, and they face premiums for Medicare Part D, the prescription drug benefit. And they also face premiums for any supplemental coverage that they choose to purchase. And retirees also face substantial cost sharing for services that are covered. And I'll just highlight two of them here. So Part A, the hospital insurance, most enrollees don't pay premiums for their Part A hospital insurance, but there's some pretty substantial cost sharing. For inpatient care, there's a $1,200 deductible for the first 60 days of care and a daily charge of several hundred dollars a day for every day after 60 days. And then there's Medicare Part D, and I'll try and succinctly describe cost sharing for Medicare Part D and how it's changed over our time period, which is not an easy task. So Medicare Part D was intended to provide nearly first dollar coverage for prescription drugs for most retirees, and it had a 25% and has a 25% co-insurance rate for the first several thousand dollars of drug spending. And I'm telling you about this type of cost sharing because many retirees with Part D still face substantial out-of-pocket medical costs for their prescription drugs. After that first several thousand dollars of medical spending with a 25% co-insurance rate, enrollees prior to 2010 hit the coverage gap or the donut hole where they were fully responsible for the next several thousand dollars of prescription drug spending until that 25% co-insurance rate kicked in again. So I tell you about that to illustrate that retirees can still face substantial prescription drug costs after the introduction of Part D, and then beginning in 2010, this donut hole or coverage gap began to be closed and should be fully closed by 2020, where enrollees will just face the 25% coinsurance rate for all of their prescription drug spending. Enrollees also um, face the full cost of uncovered services like dental and vision, and the average retiree can expect to spend nearly $200,000 in lifetime out-of-pocket costs. And I want to note that this $200,000 figure excludes the cost of long-term care. So in this project, we decompose out-of-pocket medical costs by the type of spending, by two types of spending. We look at premiums and we look at costs for services received. We um, we also examine whether the share of Social Security benefits remaining after out-of-pocket costs differs by age, type of supplemental insurance, income, or health. And providing these updated totals today is really crucial to do because there have been some recent changes in benefit generosity that I described in Medicare Part D. This project builds on several previous, previous studies that were similarly interested in the out-of-pocket burden on retirees, and these studies largely use data from 2000 to 2011 and examine out-of-pocket costs for enrollees enrolled in traditional Medicare only. And this is because many of these studies use the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey, the MCBS, which does not have good information on spending for Medicare Advantage enrollees. And the most recent estimate from 2011 shows that the average um, enrollee in traditional fee-for-service Medicare spent about $3,600 on out-of-pocket costs, and that out-of-pocket costs or, were higher or the share of Social Security income remaining after out-of-pocket costs was lower for older adults, those who were poor but not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid, those in poor health, and those who are paying for private supplemental insurance. 
And researchers project that out-of-pocket spending is expected to increase in the future at a faster rate than Social Security benefits are projected to grow. So we contribute to this literature by examining a more recent year of data after some expansions in benefit generosity, 2014, and by including Medicare Advantage enrollees who were excluded from analyses with the MCBS. So the project uses the 2002 to 2014 HRS, and I want to tell you about three different types of restrictions we make so you understand the sample on whom we're drawing these estimates. So first, the sample aims to limit attention to retirees who are fully detached from the labor force. So we restrict our attention to adults 65 and up who are receiving both Social Security and Medicare and are not working full time. We also wish to restrict attention to folks who are choosing between Medicare and supplemental insurance. So we exclude anyone who is receiving employer-sponsored insurance from a current employer, either their own or their spouse's. And finally, we are interested in the burden of medical costs excluding long-term care costs, so we focus on respondents who live in the community. I'll tell you later on how our results look when we include long-term care costs and long-term care residents. Um, the two key variables from the HRS that we use are self-reported Social Security income and self-reported out-of-pocket medical costs. We use the RAND measure of medical costs for services received, and then we add to that self-reported premiums that are reported in the HRS. And the HRS captures premium info on Medicare Advantage, or Part C, Medicare Part D, and up to three supplemental private plans. So you'll notice I didn't say Medicare Part D, and Medicare Part D premiums can be up to $1,200 a year. These are not captured in a self-reported manner in the HRS, so we will include them um, when we return to this project after this conference and incorporate the CAM spending data and the administrative benefits data. So the results I present today might understate medical costs and overstate Social Security benefit generosity because I'm leaving Part B out of the, out of the medical costs. And we combine these two measures from the HRS into our outcome of interest, which is the share of benefits um, remaining after out-of-pocket medical spending is taken out. So let's first look at what total out-of-pocket spending looks like in 2014 at different points in the distribution. Let's start with the mean and just focus for now on the top of these stacked bar charts. This is telling you about total medical out-of-pocket spending. So the average retiree spends just over $3,000 on out-of-pocket medical costs. And out-of-pocket spending is highly skewed. At the 95th percentile, out-of-pocket spending is more than twice what out-of-pocket spending is at the mean or the median. So now pay attention to the shading. The maroon part of these bars reflects spending on premiums, and the gray part of these bars reflects, reflects spending on other out-of-pocket costs for, cover, for services that were received. So more than half of a retiree's costs are contributed towards premiums. You can see that at all the points in the distribution. At the mean, the average retiree pays $1,700 in premiums and $1,300 in other costs. And retirees at higher points in the distribution and out-of-pocket spending spend more on premiums and still have substantial other out-of-pocket costs, which indicates that even retirees with more supplemental coverage still have many costs that are left uncovered. What we're really interested in is how does this out-of-pocket spending compare to Social Security income. So look at the dark black part of these bar charts um, to see what the percentage of Social Security income remaining is after retirees pay premiums and other out-of-pocket costs. The average retiree has only 74.7 or about 75% of their Social Security income remaining after retirees pay premiums and other pocket costs other out-of-pocket costs. At the fifth percentile, retirees have less than 20% of their Social Security income remaining after out-of-pocket medical costs. And at the 10th percentile, retirees are spending more than half of their Social Security income on out-of-pocket medical costs. So for a really large number of retirees, out-of-pocket costs comprise a sizable share of their Social Security income. We then explore how the share of Social Security income remaining varies by the type of supplemental insurance. Um, not surprisingly, those with Medicaid have the highest share of income remaining at 89%, and those with Medicare Advantage have, um, uh, and that's not surprising because many Medicaid enrollees don't face cost sharing or don't pay, pre or many don't pay premiums or face minimal cost sharing. Retirees enrolled in Medicare Advantage have the second highest share of Social Security income remaining at 84%. And then there are two results in this figure that surprised us. The first is that the share remaining for those with retiree health insurance is so low. And if you look at that bar, you'll see that the reason it's so low seems to be because of the high premiums that those with retiree health insurance are paying. They're not receiving much more in terms of covered, or they don't face many more costs in terms of covered services, but they are paying higher premiums. And while this was surprising to us, 
at first, it is consistent with what the previous literature has found, that there are substantial premium costs for private supplemental insurance. Um, and then the other one that surprised us was what we called Medicare only, the group that has no other supplemental coverage. Um, and we were surprised that their share of Social Security benefits remaining was so high. And as you look at this figure, I want to caution you that we're not conditioning or adjusting these numbers for anything. So if folks who have no supplemental insurance receive less health care, they may have a higher share of their Social Security income remaining net of out-of-pocket costs if they're just not receiving as much health care as those with, um, with generous supplemental insurance. We next considered how the share of Social Security benefits remaining varies by age. As you'll see here, when we exclude long-term costs, the share of Social Security benefits remaining doesn't vary much by age. Now, when we include long-term care residents and long-term care costs, we do see substantial differences across the distribution of age. In fact, those who are 80 and older have a share of Social Security benefits remaining that's five percentage points lower than those who are ages 65 to 69. We were also curious how benefit adequacy varies across the distribution of income, and we find the share of benefits remaining after medical spending decreases with household income, falling from 77% at the lowest quintile to 70% 70, 70 at the highest quintile, and for everyone except for those in the top quintile, um, premium spending increases along with Social Security benefits, and spending on other services receive falls, so it's suggesting that middle-income households are buying supplemental insurance um, to, support, to support their care. We also consider differences in benefit adequacy by health status, and we consider two measures of health status. The first measure we consider is whether the respondent reports two or more activities of daily living, or ADLs, and this means that someone might need assistance walking across a room or assistance eating or getting dressed. We also consider a measure of poor health to be whether the respondent reports one or more chronic conditions, such as cancer, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes. So the folks with the that are in poor health by these two measures are in the third and the fifth bars on this chart. And as you can see, the share of Social Security benefits available for non-medical spending is just slightly lower for the less healthy retirees. And it's also interesting to see that they're receiving more services, but not necessarily paying more in premiums. And so um, in the interest of time, I will move on to trends instead of summarizing the 2014 benefits for you. And here we see what's happening at the mean and other points in the distribution between 2002 and 2014. And I want to first point out that medical spending in 2002 appears to be an outlier. So I'm going to focus on changes between 2004 and 2014. So the red line here shows what's happening to mean out-of-pocket medical spending. It fell by $800 from 2004 to 2014. This is a decrease of 20%, and there's a similar decline at the median. And there are declines over this period that span the introduction of Medicare Part D of about $500 between 2004 and 2008, and then another decline of about $500 after the, the donut hole began to be closed following 2010. Um, so there are certainly declines that are consistent with um, introducing a new benefit and expanding benefit generosity. So with these documented declines in out-of-pocket spending, we'd expect the share of Social Security benefits remaining after out-of-pocket medical spending is taken out to increase, and in fact, that's what we observe. We observe between a 6 and 7 percentage point increase between 2004 and 2014 at both the mean and the median, and we document much larger increases at the bottom of the distribution. At the 10th percentile, it increases by 17 percentage points. We also observe the largest gains over time for groups that would benefit the most from supplemental drug coverage. So as we expect, the gains are largest for retirees um, enrolled in Medicare only. We see a, a gain of 12 percentage points, and those enrolled in Medicare Advantage, we see a gain of 7 percentage points. We don't see much change for those enrolled in Medicaid or who have retiree health insurance, which is not surprising because Medicaid and many retiree drug plans, retiree health plans, excuse me, often included drug coverage prior to 2006. Retirees with chronic conditions saw a larger increase of almost nine percentage points between 2004 and 2014. And these gains are almost three times as large as the gains among healthier retirees who have no chronic conditions. We also examined changes over time for the other splits I presented today by age, by income, um, and we didn't see much difference over time by these splits, so I won't present those today. So to conclude, this study examines the adequacy of Social Security benefits, which we evaluate be based on the beneficiary's Social Security income minus their out-of-pocket medical costs. And we include premiums, cost sharing for covered services, and the cost of uncovered services from all types of medical care, excluding long-term care. 
we find that seniors face a substantial amount of non-discretionary medical um, cost. In 2014, the average retiree had only 75% of their Social Security benefit remaining for non-medical spending. And over 10% of retirees are spending more than half of their Social Security benefit on medical costs. Premiums comprise the largest share of medical spending for the retirees in our sample. And as with others, most notably the Medicare Trustees Report, our evidence is certainly consistent with um, Social Security benefit adequacy rising after Medicare Part D was introduced in 2006 and rising again after the donut hole began to be closed beginning in 2010, but really in 2011. However, Medicare costs are expected to rise in the years ahead, which is going to place further pressure on Social Security beneficiaries' budgets. Thank you.